Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining in the middle of your busy lunch day. Hope everyone's having a wonderful Thursday. I see a bunch of people trickling in. Hi, all. I'm just going to get started. I feel like these things, you can wait till a critical number of people join or you just go ahead and start. So I'm going to start. My name is Pietro Bordoletto. I'm a reproductive endocrinologist and infertility doctor at Boston IVF. But in addition to taking care of infertility, I wear a couple of other hats. I'm a oncofertility doctor, meaning I take care of patients who are about to undergo chemo, surgery, radiation, things that can hurt how their ovaries, uterus, cervix work uh, before, we, before they actually undergo those treatments. But why we're all here today is to talk about my third hat that I wear, which is I'm a reproductive surgeon. So I help people figure out how we can fix structural issues in the uterus, the fallopian tubes, the ovaries, the cervix, the vagina, literally anywhere where it's related to reproduction. Sometimes things can kind of pop up and become problematic. And we often do things that can avoid IVF, avoid insemination, improve our chances that IVF or insemination will work. So it's really nice to be here with all of you. I want to tell you a little bit more about reproductive surgery. Um, I was told that I need to tell you where I see patients. I see patients in our Stoneham office, in our Waltham office, but really mostly on telemedicine, wherever it's convenient for patients. We like to meet them where they are. Um, I operate out of Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, Beth Israel in Needham, and uh, Winchester Hospital. So a bunch of great places where we can serve patients in the kind of the north uh, West and central Boston areas. So let me tell you a little bit about what reproductive surgery is and why we do it. You've probably have all heard of polyps, fibroids, endometriosis, Asherman's. These are all conditions that exist within the uterus, the fallopian tubes and the ovaries and people who have the ability to reproduce. And when, depending where they are, they can cause different kinds of problems. So I'm gonna start off by telling you a little bit about some of the, the bread and butter surgery that we do. Hysteroscopy, for example. Hysteroscopy is a procedure that can either be performed in the office without any anesthesia or in an operative setting while you're asleep and snoring. It's a little camera that goes through the cervix into the uterus and allows us to take a peek inside the uterine cavity. And all the action that happens in reproduction is happening inside the uterus. But there are things that can grow inside the uterus that can make that a little bit trickier and less efficient. Polyps. Polyps are like skin tacks. Some people have them, some people don't, but when they're inside the uterus, they can certainly hurt your chances of conceiving on your own. They can bleed, they can secrete mucus, it's bad surface area for an embryo to try to stick to. So we easily remove them, just in the same way that you imagine a skin tag on your, on your arm. We go with a little camera, we find that area, we nip it at the base and remove it. And the chances of polyps coming back, particularly if you have just one or two big polyps, are really small. There are some women, particularly women with PCOS, women at higher weights, and sometimes just a genetic predisposition who will form lots of polyps. And those are women who sometimes have a couple of these procedures every so often. But polyps typically take a while to grow back. They take weeks to months, not days to weeks to come back, if they're going to come back at all. But the chances of coming back are really small. So we remove these polyps in the office. We remove them in the operating room setting. And I tell patients that if we do the surgery today, you may have some crampiness, some spotting today and tomorrow, but by the time two to three days from now rolls around, you're going to feel like it never happened, which is really lovely. And that means that you can also try to get pregnant with your very next menstrual cycle. There's not a big delay after removing polyps. In addition to polyps when you're inside the uterus, one of the things that we can remove are fibroids or treat scar tissue or treat um, old pregnancy tissue that's still stuck in the uterus that doesn't need to be there. Fibroids are kind of these rubbery nodules that grow within the muscle of the uterus, and they can grow anywhere within the uterus, on the outside, on the middle wall of the uterus, or even poking into the cavity of the uterus. And typically, the ones that are most problematic are the ones that are poking in the cavity of the uterus, and those are the ones that we really talk about removing hysteroscopically. For the same reasons as polyps, they change the shape, the surface, the size of the, the cavity. It's bad surface area for an embryo that's trying to stick. They can bleed. They can cause pain. There's a bunch of great reasons to remove them. Fibroids we typically remove in the operating room setting, so we need you to be asleep. We use a slightly bigger camera, but kind of the same idea. Through the cervix, into the uterus, a little water in the uterus to look around. And then when we see a fibroid, we try to shave it out completely. Some people kind of loft the top off of it and leave the bottom half. It's kind of like melting the top of an iceberg, but leaving the rest. It's no bueno. you got to take the whole thing out if you're really trying to make symptoms better. Um, and actually get the cavity back to normal shape and size. So we do that procedure, it's called a hysteroscopic myomectomy. Most typically take a little bit longer, kind of on the order of 
20 to 30 minutes. The recovery is very similar. You go home about an hour afterwards and two to three days of kind of that spotting and cramping are not uncommon. Motrin and Tylenol work really well. I tell people to wear a pad or a, a liner or a tampon for a day or two afterwards just to make sure that they're not cut off, caught off guard by the bleeding. But it recovers pretty quick. Depending on the kind of fibroid, you could conceive as early as your very next period. And sometimes if it's multiple fibroids or a really big one, I tell people just sit one month out. And then with your very next period, you should be good to try to conceive. But it really depends on the fibroid. But we take care of those all the time. They're very easy. We do this surgery at our surgery center in Waltham every Friday after morning and afternoon. Now, the other kind of unique uses for hysteroscopy, sometimes people can miscarry pregnancies. I'm sure a lot of you have already experienced this personally, or I've had friends who've experienced it, but when there's tissue that's inside the uterus that's not coming out, traditionally we used to think about doing a DNC, where you use a little straw to go through the cervix into the uterus and try to remove that tissue. But hysteroscopy actually allows us to look at that area with retained tissue with our own two eyes. And when we see that area, instead of trying to scrape or blindly remove some of this tissue, we can very targetedly go in, see it, pluck it out and minimize any damage to the uterus. It's also a nice way for trying to biopsy something. Seeing it with your own two eyes is better than trying to use a, um, a little curette to remove it. That's a quick procedure, 15, 20 minutes, very similar recovery to a polyp or a fibroid, but it's a nice way to minimize um, creating scar tissue, particularly at people who are at higher risk of having scar tissue formation already. And now the, that's hysteroscopy. That's kind of the bread and butter that so many of our infertility doctors do already. But there's a group of us that do slightly more involved surgery that happens offsite, not at Boston IVF. And these are laparoscopic procedures that happen at Beth Israel Needham, Milton Hospital, one of my partners operates at, um, Beth Israel Deaconess in Winchester. This is where we're doing laparoscopy. Laparoscopy is a slightly bigger procedure. This typically requires general anesthesia. You're in an operating room and it's a little camera that instead of going through the cervix and into the uterus, this camera is now going through the belly button into the abdomen. Instead of putting water in the uterus, we're putting gas in the belly to give us some safe space to operate and take a look around. And what are the things that we're hoping to look for? So with laparoscopy, we would try to look at the structures that we can see with our eyes. So we look at uterus, fallopian tubes, ovaries, but we're also looking in front and behind at the glistening surfaces that kind of hold all of this together. And that's where women can have something called endometriosis, for example. That's a common reason why we do laparoscopy. Endometriosis is where you have glandular tissues that are normally supposed to be growing inside of the uterus that have made their way outside and they're implanting on any of these structures that you can see with your own two eyes. And when they're there, the problem is the body's not used to seeing those tissues in those spots. This tissue behaves like the inside of the uterus in that it bleeds, it grows, it sheds, it causes inflammation. We have all these nerves that aren't used to seeing it. So the nerves kind of get beat up over time and how that gets experienced is painful periods, painful intercourse, um, people can have uh, pain with transvaginal ultrasounds, pain with pooping or peeing. These are all things that kind of coincide with endometriosis. So when people tell me they have these symptoms, when they have a strong family history, these are things that we do laparoscopy for. We go and take a look. And if we find it, the, the best way to treat endometriosis is to actually cut it out. Cut out the areas safely to try to give the nerves an opportunity to regrow. And the nerves that have been beat up just give an opportunity to cool off reduce inflammation in the pelvis and make everything in the pelvis, the ovaries, the, the uterus, all work a little bit better, but also just make people feel better. There's so much endometriosis out there that's kind of getting brushed aside as these are just crampy periods, suck it, cut up and deal with it. And that's not the case. Uh, most women don't have pain with their periods. And if you're having pain with your periods, we should talk. Endometriosis is one of the big conditions we treat on laparoscopy, but we can also do fibroids. I told you that fibroids can grow anywhere in the uterus, commonly on the inside lining of the uterus, but sometimes within the muscle, but often on the outside. So if we stick a camera through the belly button into the uterus and we see a fibroid, those are fibroids that we can remove. We cut them out. Let's kind of think about it like a banana and a banana peel analogy. The fibroid is the banana. The banana peel is the uterus. You need to open up carefully the uterus to take the banana out, but then you got to put Humpty Dumpty back together again because you need this uterus to work. We need it to carry a pregnancy. We need it to go to, into labor. We need it to, to do all the normal functions of what a uterus should be doing. So myomectomy is the process of taking out a fibroid but leaving the uterus. We do lots of those procedures. Those are ways to kind of preserve the, the uterus but make symptoms of fibroids feel better. Heavy bleeding, heavy pain, cramping, um, pain with intercourse. These are all symptoms that women can have if they have or are suffering from fibroids. 
Finally, we can do surgery on the fallopian tubes and the ovaries during laparoscopy. So women can form cysts. It's not uncommon to see cysts growing on the ovaries. Um, when we see them, there's some cysts that we need to treat, meaning that we're worried about them or we need to help them resolve, but a lot of cysts just go away by their own. Typically, the cysts that we take for surgery are the ones that we're worried about um, causing problems with the ovary's blood supply. They can flip on themselves and kind of choke the blood supply to the ovary, and that's not a good thing. Dermoids, those, those are the cysts that can have hair, fatty tissues, all kinds of different kinds of tissues in them. Endometriosis can implant on the ovary and form a cyst that's called an endometrioma. And then we take out cysts that we're worried about that we think need to get a little bit better evaluated. So those are all surgeries that kind of follow the same banana, banana peel analogy. The ovary is the uh, banana peel, the cyst is the banana. You carefully open it up, take out the inside, and make sure that everything else stays intact. Because, you know, a woman's born with every egg she's ever going to have at birth, and it's typically several million eggs in the ovary. But every time you operate on the ovary, you can damage that pool. So you want to be very careful. You want to make sure that whoever's operating on your ovary does a lot of these surgeries and is very thoughtful about how they handle your normal ovarian tissue. That's laparoscopy. Sometimes we have to do surgery for other things. Um, there's kind of a whole another bucket category of, of pathologies in the uterus. And one of them is happening in the fallopian tubes. So you may have heard of something called a hydrosalpinx. Hydrosalpinx is where the fallopian tube actually becomes scarred, damaged, and dilated. And instead of having a nice plumbing system where you bring eggs from the ovaries into the uterus, the fallopian tube, the, the highway that does all of that, becomes scarred or inflamed. And when it becomes scarred or inflamed, it fills up with fluid. And we think a little bit about this as standing water. So standing water out on your porch can just kind of get mucky. The standing water that's trapped in the tube can spill back into the uterus. And in, I told you the uterus is where the action's happening. We don't want embryos to be exposed to this standing fluid. So when we see that fluid there, we think, well, we should probably think about treating the source from where it's coming from. The treatment for hydrosalpinx or a dilated fallopian tube is actually just the removal of the fallopian tube. And there's a lot of misconception about removing a fallopian tube. Can I get pregnant? How does it impact my ovaries? The ovaries are where the eggs are. The fallopian tubes are plumbing at this point. If you have one fallopian tube and one ovary, your ability to get pregnant is still there. Certainly not as efficient as having two fallopian tubes and two ovaries, but if that bad fallopian tube is there and we don't take care of it, it's not certainly gonna hurt your chances of becoming pregnant, even with a good fallopian tube on the other side. It also actually increases your chances of ectopic pregnancy. Um, so those are pregnancies that implant outside of the uterus. So we really counsel patients that they're worth at least evaluating and figuring out if they make sense to remove. So we take care of a lot of women who, who have hydrosol pinks and need to have it surgically removed. There's a whole other bucket category of procedures that I perform that probably not a lot of reproductive docs do. And these are malarian anomalies. The malarian system refers to the embryologic origin of what the fallopian tubes, the uterus, the cervix, and even part of the vagina develop from. And in development, those structures typically develop as two separate pieces, all the way up by the kidneys. And when we are forming, the uterus is up by the kidneys, but it's actually making its way down into the pelvis. It has to fuse at the midline and then has to hollow out. So it's actually this triangular shaped uterus that we all know um, to be able to carry a pregnancy. Sometimes those steps don't go very well. So you can get things called malarian anomalies where the part of the uterus doesn't develop. The uterus develops with the septum. The uterus develops, but the cervix doesn't. The vagina develops, but it has a big line of tissue running through it. This is a kind of a whole host of pretty rare pathologies that we see that can certainly impact your ability to have sex, have non-painful periods, become pregnant. Um, that we take care of as reproductive surgeons, as people who do malarian anomalies, which are challenging procedures because they're rare things. That it's not something that a lot of other surgeons get to see or do a whole lot of. So it's good to go to someone who has experience and does a lot of these. And then the final kind of procedure that we do is laparotomy. This is open surgery. If you've ever had a C-section, that's what we're talking about when we're talking about laparotomy. It's those bigger incisions while you're asleep in an operating room. The cool thing about the big incisions is that it allows us to do some big surgery through it. So women who have really big uteruses, uteruses where they look like they're six months pregnant, sometimes those aren't best tackled laparoscopically through the small incisions on the belly. And making a bigger incision, kind of like a C-section scar, allows us to do the surgery slightly safer, allows us to do the surgery quicker, and make sure that we put the uterus back together so that it continued to do its job of being able to carry a pregnancy successfully. 
Those procedures are called abdominal myomectomies. And those procedures happen in operating rooms. They typically take a little bit longer than laparoscopic procedures because we know we're doing something bigger once we're inside the abdomen. There's also a longer recovery. It's laparoscopy, most patients go home the same day. They tell them it's typically seven to 10 days of recovery. With an abdominal procedure where you have the bigger incision, there's a little bit more healing that has to happen. So people typically spend one to three days in the hospital after surgery and typically two to four weeks of recovery at home. Depending on what kind of work they do and how active they are, they can get back to work pretty quickly. It just really depends on how they feel. Now with most fibroid surgery, particularly laparoscopic surgery and abdominal myomectomy, there's always a delay with having to conceive afterwards. And it really depends on the number of fibroids and where they are. Big fibroids that are within the wall of the uterus where you're having to really cut into the uterus, take this fibroid out and put the uterus back together in nice strong layers, you're going to want to let that uterus heal for a couple of weeks. I typically tell people four to six months is the sweet spot to allow that uterus to heal because we know that the uterus is going to stretch when you become pregnant and we know that it's going to be under pressure and we don't want a bad scar causing problems. It's also not uncommon depending on where the scar is and how big the uterus is that you're going to have to have a c-section typically earlier than 39 or 40 weeks to help avoid the uterus to go into labor the uterus with a big scar that tries to clamp down or scar in on itself those are uteruses that run the risk of having that scar separate or rupture that can become an emergency and becomes not safe for moms or babies so it's not uncommon with big fibroid surgery that we recommend a c-section for delivery I see a question here from uh, Jennifer. I have a hydrosalpinx on the right tube and currently eight weeks pregnant without heartbeat with frozen transfer. Now, can I do the DNC and laparoscopic procedure at the same time? That's a great question. That really depends on your doctor. Most people try not to operate on a pregnant uterus or recently pregnant uterus because there's a lot of blood supply that's going into that uterus to support the pregnancy or the recently passed pregnancy. And doing surgery to remove that fallopian tube at the same time, some people feel strongly about. Me personally, I would feel comfortable taking out a fallopian tube and performing a DNC at the same time, but it varies a lot surgeon to surgeon. I think the smartest thing to do is to get through a pregnancy episode safely and then do the surgery that would hopefully help increase chances for future um, ability to get pregnant. That's a good question, though. If there are other questions that people have, please go ahead and, and share them. I'm happy to add. Lisa, is the incision for the abdominal myomectomy the same incision spot as the C-section incision? Thank you, Lisa, for that question. Um, It depends. Most of the time when we're using um, an incision, it depends on what we're trying to go after that's on the inside. So when we're using a fan and steel incision, which is that little curved incision right above the hairline, just like a C-section, we're typically doing that because we think that the fiber that we're trying to take out will fit through that incision. It's low in the pelvis. It's not terribly big. Think about the size of a baby's head, that size and smaller. That's kind of the sweet spot. When we have to go after bigger pathologies or lots of fibers and the uterus has kind of grown out of the pelvis, it's up by the belly button now, those are incisions that you just have to make vertical. So you go sometimes from the pubic bone to the belly button and with really big pathology, sometimes above the belly button. But it really depends person to person what you're trying to tackle and how high out of the pelvis the, the uterus is. We do both all the time. What question should someone be asking when selecting a surgeon for the best outcome? Oh, that's a great question. I think the very first thing you should be asking your surgeon is, how many of these do you do? Some procedures are really rare. If a surgeon says, oh, I do two or three of these a year, that may sound like a very small number, but if there's only two or three of these a year happening in the whole state, then you want that person doing your procedure. And I think that's very true for the malarian anomaly procedures that I talked about. But things like polyps, fibroids, endometriosis, bad tubes, These are pretty common procedures, and you want a surgeon that's doing these procedures monthly. You don't want someone who does them once or twice a month, that's for sure. There's not an absolute number for each procedure, but I think you want to gauge a sense of, is this the kind of thing that you see infrequently or frequently? And you really want a high-volume surgeon. These are There's a lot of good data to suggest that patients have better outcomes um, when they have someone operating on them who does a lot of surgery and does a lot of these procedures. I think you should ask a little bit about what complication rates look like. That's always an important question. Um, what kind of complications can happen from this procedure? How often do you see them? What do you do to manage these complications? Some procedures are really low risk. Removing a little polyp or a fiber from the uterus via hysteroscopy is really straightforward. But the bigger surgeries, the laparoscopy, the open procedures, I think it's to get a 
good to get a sense of what could go wrong, even though it's rare, just to have that conversation about how do you view managing these complications from your surgeon. Finally, ask them how far they're booking out. Unfortunately, the whole world is short-staffed, including the operating rooms. So if your surgeon's telling you they're, they can get you in tomorrow, that's a little unusual. That probably means that they're a lower volume surgeon and have space to fill. Um, if someone's telling you they're booking out weeks to months, I think that's a little bit more realistic of an experience for high volume surgeons that we'd love to take care of patients at ASAP, but there's just so many patients that we're waiting to do surgery on already. Um, but that's not an absolute truth. Some people just have more access to an operating room. If there are other questions, make sure you drop them in the chat. We have a couple more minutes. Um, I know fibroids and endometriosis are typically pretty hot topics that people have lots of questions about. One thing that I get asked a lot about is how do these things affect my ability to become pregnant? So not every fibroid, not and every patient with endometriosis, not every polyp is going to hurt chances of reproduction the same way. Typically, the things that we think are most problematic are the ones that are cavity distorting. Polyps, fibroids, scar tissue, things that really change that triangular shape of the uterus. That's bread and butter and easy. The procedures that are a little harder to give a sense of are um, endometriosis. Endometriosis is an inflammatory condition primarily. And we think that reducing the inflammation in the pelvis will make the ovaries work a little bit better, make the uterus work a little bit better, and all of those things in conjunction will support that early period of pregnancy a little bit better. There's not a lot of good data to support that, but I think it's more of an experiential thing when taking care of patients, and we've seen this time after time. We have two more questions. What is the recurrence rate of scar tissue after hysteroscopy with balloon placement? That's a good question. It really varies on the extent of scar tissue and where it is. A little tiny scar up by the top of the uterus is not going to be a problematic scar. But a balloon's not going to do a great job at taking care of preventing scar tissue there because the balloons are typically round and in the middle of the uterus. If you have one big thick band of scar tissue running down the middle of the uterus, you take care of it and you put a balloon there, the balloon's going to do a pretty good job of taking care of that for you. I had a partial myomectomy as I had adhesions which were stuck to my intestines so could not access. Can I still have IUF safely with a fibroid uterus? Absolutely. Fibroids are in the uterus. What we're talking about with IFF is the ability to access the ovaries. That's where the magic's happening. That's where we're growing eggs um, in the ovaries. Now with IVF, we have to be able to get a needle from the vagina into the ovaries and into the eggs. And for a lot of women with fibroid uteruses, these um, ovaries are pulled up out of the pelvis and it makes it really hard to reach. So some of us, there's not a lot of reproductive surgeons um, or not a lot of reproductive endocrinologists who, are, who, who offer this, but we can do abdominal egg retrievals where instead of going through the vagina into the ovaries, we're able to go up by the belly button or up by the, the, the pelvic bones from the abdomen with that needle and retrieve eggs that way. That's particularly helpful for people with big fibroid uteruses that have moved out of the pelvis or ovaries that have been surgically moved out of the pelvis ahead of radiation, for example. Does DNC performed under complete anesthesia. Uh, DNCs can be performed under light sedation or general anesthesia. It depends on what your surgeon and surgical center do. And recovery to the, for the next transfer, most people say take about a month off. Take, give it one good period before trying to conceive again. But again, that varies physician to physician and make sure you ask your doctor about that question. I have time for maybe one or two more questions. I know we're wrapping up on time here at the 25 minute mark. Um, you know, reproductive surgery, infertility, they're all very, very intertwined. If I can be helpful to any of you who are looking to talk a little bit more about your fertility or talk about reproductive surgery issues, I see patients at our Stonem office, I see patients at our Waltham office, and also very happy to see patients um, via telemedicine, whatever's most convenient for you. Um, we have hours early in the morning and later in the afternoons as well, because I know it's hard to get away from work and talk about these things in a, in a private scenario. So again, thanks everyone for joining. I really appreciate um, people taking time out of their day to join. Um, happy National Infertility Awareness Week to all of those who are currently struggling with infertility, those who work in the field, and those who are kind of in the thick of it right now. Um, Boston IVF is here. We're a partner. We're here to help. Um, and we look forward to taking care of some of you and adding value and, and uh, figuring out how to help you guys build your family. Thanks so much. and hope everyone has a wonderful rest of your afternoon. Bye.